Hello everyone, this is Pastor John from Third Presbyterian Church, and this is week number seven of our Bible study called Amazing Wisdom, Amazing Women. This week, we're going to take a look at Deborah. In the Old Testament book of Judges, we learn about Deborah. Deborah wears three hats. She's considered by some to be a prophet, by others as one of the judges of Israel, and she was also mentioned in the Bible as a mom. While all three are important, let's look first at what she is best known for, and that's being a judge. Before we get into looking at Deborah in detail, let's first of all get an understanding of what it was like during this period of judges in the land of Israel. When the Hebrew people finally escaped their captivity in Egypt and were given and eventually made it into the promised land, they didn't simply run in there and claim territories. God had an organized plan for them that they would take over different areas of the land by the tribes from which they came from. And there were 12 different tribes. So you can see on this map that the tribes are, are divided up and the different colors represent the different land areas where those tribes were to develop. Now, each tribe was responsible for its own maintenance, its own governance. The people were not totally happy about that because since some of these tribes were very small and rather weak, they were constantly being taken over by one of the other uh, uh, groups uh, that were much more powerful. So the people kept asking for uh, a unifying ruler and they modeled it after all the other countries that surrounded the Hebrew people, they wanted to have a king. But God kept resisting the king because God was concerned that they would begin to worship that king and not trust in God. Finally, there was a bit of a compromise. God said that God, that God would bring forth judges. These judges would rule over the disputes that people were having, kind of like Moses had done, but they also would be military leaders and help protect any of the tribes that were being attacked by anyone. So there were these judges that emerged and their stories are recorded in the book of Judges. Now, when we look at this map, I know we think it's a rather large area, but in reality, at its widest point, it was about 70 miles, 75 miles across. At its tallest point, it was about 150 miles. That's from Dan all the way down to Beersheba. So in total, it's about 11,250 square miles. If you take that square mileage and compare it to the states in the United States, the state of Maryland is about 12,000 square miles. So really this region that we're talking about is about the same amount of land size as the state of Maryland. So these judges would be called forth, not only to settle disputes, but to also become military leaders. And there seemed to be a pattern that would take place. Whenever there was a lot of di dismay and depression hitting the Hebrew people, a judge would be called forth. The judge would then also <clears throat> attack <clears throat> whoever it was that was giving the Israelites problems at that particular time. They would, of course, win. And then for the remaining period of their time as the judge, it would be a peaceful situation. When they died, then things would go sour again until the next judge came along and everything repeated itself. So if you look at the chart <clears throat> that I've also placed on this page, you can see in the book of Judges, the different judges that are identified. And if you count down from the top, Deborah is the fourth judge. Now it says that Deborah comes out of the tribe of Ephraim. And if you look back at the map, you can see that Ephraim is just about in the center of, of this area. It's bordered on the east by the Jordan River and it goes almost all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. This particular land had a combination of mountains, hills, and valleys, and it really is some of the most fertile ground in all the region. So it was a very important uh, part of the history of Israel and certainly a place of major agricultural uh, dominance which made it susceptible to be challenged by some of the other nations that surrounded the Hebrew people. 
We're told one of those nations were, was a group called the Canaanites, and they had been oppressing the people for some 20 years. Then Deborah was called forth to be a judge, and after a battle, uh, there was about 40 years of peace until Deborah passes away, and then there's another period of six years or so where there's oppression until Gideon comes along and everything repeats itself again. Let's read how it appears in the Bible in Judges 2, 18 through 19 with the New International Version. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. So during the period of the judge, everything was great. When the judge died, everything went into chaos. And it appeared to be even worse than it was before. And some of the things that were going on was following other gods, serving them and worshiping them, and just doing a bunch of evil practices and being stubborn in their ways. When Deborah emerges as a judge, her name means bee. And it was kind of appropriate because the scriptures suggest that she could sting her enemies, uh, but she brought sweetness to the people, so that B was a very appropriate name for this particular judge. Now let's read what it says in Judges 4, 4 through 5. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lipidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes settled. So the story of Deborah begins with Deborah doing what every other judge does. They kind of sit there in, in a court. This court happens to be under a palm tree. And it's between two major uh, cities, Ramah and Bethel. And she's hearing these disputes. So day in and day out, she's listening to disputes, rendering a decision. Well, this is going on. But at the same time, there's a guy named Jabin who's the ruler of the Canaanites. And he has a top military commander named Sisera. And we're told in the text that Sisera had command of 900 chariots of iron. Now to make those battle worthy chariots, Canaan would have had to have had lots of wealth and would have had to be in bed with Egypt, Syria, Moab, and Edom, who were at times enemies of the Hebrew people to help get all the supplies together to build these chariots. So the Hebrew people were facing not only the uh, oversight and the uh, harshness of the Canaanite king and his top military leader, but this particular group of Canaanites was in bed with all the other nations around. So they really had to kind of prove a point that if they didn't defeat the Canaanites, then the other nations around them would simply be ready to pick them off at the appropriate times as well. Deborah is called upon then to do more than just decide these disputes. She's called upon to challenge to battle the Canaanites. So then we read where Deborah hatches a plan. She contacts her military leader, who's named Barak, and asks him to gather an army of 20,000 men, 10,000 from each of two different tribes. He's very reluctant to do this. He's a great military leader, and he knows when he's vastly outnumbered, and to take on the Canaanite army, in his opinion, was gonna take way more than 20,000 men. But Deborah is convinced that God will help them execute this plan, no matter what their size. And so she goes and convinces Barak that this is a good plan, that really, he only needs this army to act as a decoy while she or someone else slips in and attacks Sisera directly. Well, that's not exactly how the battle unfolds. As it unfolds, it appears that even though the Hebrews were completely outgunned, they defeat the Canaanite army, even against the chariots of Sisera, 
to the point where the scriptures talk about Sisera jumping off of his chariot and running away to escape. So the battle is won by the Hebrew people, obviously with the hand of God overseeing everything, which is exactly how Deborah predicted it would take place. The killing of Sisera doesn't take place at this point in the story, but it does happen eventually. <clears throat> Thus far, we have seen Deborah as a judge who was also a military leader and a prophetess who predicted with God on their side, they would defeat the enemy. And now we get into chapter five of Judges where we see her take on the role of sharing her feelings in a song. It's of course referred to as the Song of Deborah. One of the central focus themes of the song is the repetitive use of the words, bless the Lord. In the King James Version of the Lord's Prayer, taught to us by Jesus, the second line begins with, hallowed be thy name. This is the same wording that means to bless the Lord. So Deborah in her song spends a great deal of time referring back to everything that's happening in life as an opportunity to bless the Lord. There are some themes that emerge from Deborah's song as recorded in Judges chapter five. The first theme is that we are to remember what God did for us in the past. Now this is a very common theme for the people of Israel. They are constantly being reminded of what God has done for them, particularly when they forget that God will be with them in the future. Second of all, the theme talks about how the people had become depressed under the rule of the Canaanites. And hopefully they would learn their lesson. They would learn that they've got to stay in good spirits with the God of creation. And it's only when they step sideways and step out of God's faithfulness do, that they get themselves into trouble. The third theme of her song is that God blesses leaders who are willing to actually lead the people. And that goes hand in hand with number four, that the Lord blesses followers who are willing to follow their leaders. So you can simply take a moment to look back at the history of the Hebrew people and see that when leaders were there leading and people were following and they were all following the voice of God, everything was great. But when people stopped following or when leaders stopped leading, and especially when they all stopped listening to the voice of God, then chaos breaks loose. I think that same formula is certainly at work in the world today. We have leaders who lead and people who follow, but important in all of that is that leaders who lead and people who fo followers who follow have to always be looking to God for their strength and for their direction. Because number five, the theme in that song says that God orchestrated this large battle and God delivered the people, number six, from that battle in victory. So sometimes, there's a, a, an insinuation here that sometimes difficult battles happen in our life and that those may have either come from God orchestrating that battle for us or by stepping back and letting the battle happen. But in either way, if we hold fast to God, we can be delivered in victory. And then she ends her song with asking everyone to remember what God is doing for them now. Now, I think this is an important song, not just for the Israelites, but for us as well, because so often we fall into these same patterns. And you can take whatever battle it is that you're facing. It doesn't have to be an army of Canaanites. It can be whatever kind of issue or problem you're dealing with in your life at that moment. If you really examine the problem, it may be because you're not trusting God to help you walk through this problem or show you how to get through or show you what's on the other side of the problem so that you can get through. It's all about your relationship and your trust and your ability to follow God. And I think that's a, an important theme that we learned from Deborah. Deborah's song was not only for the Israelites, but also for all the kings that surrounded them. Deborah 
it's important that we understand that Deborah points out that in this particular battle, God defeated the Canaanites. But all you other nations that think you can just come and attack God's people, we've got news for you. We might be outnumbered. We might have not have the weaponry that you have, but we have God on our side. So as we have done before, we look at the wisdom that we have in these uh, women of the Bible. And this particular one is the wisdom of Deborah. First of all, she begins her life as a wife and a mom. Pretty common average person. But suddenly she is elevated to a level to hear disagreements and make judgment calls. So God takes her from that role of just being an ordinary mom and wife to that of being a judge. But then, as things escalate, she's called upon to be a military leader. Now, because of her faith and her ability to understand that God will be with her every step, she becomes a prophetess in that she's able to predict the outcome of the battle because, again, she knows God is on her side, even though she's vastly outnumbered. Well, then when God proves that God was on her side, as she had predicted, she responds by praising God and also calling upon the people and the nations around to heed the warning about not following the one true God. God is there to walk with you. And if you choose not to walk with God, then when things come along that are going to harm you or hurt you or cause problems in your life, and you've suddenly turned your back on God, then you don't have God to help you walk through. Now, that's not saying you can't change your ways and find God to walk with you. But an important point is that she always, no matter what, stays faithful to God, even when the world seems to turn against her or you, as the case may be. Now, this battle takes place and the Hebrew people are victorious under Deborah's leadership, but the story is not quite finished yet. You remember that when we began this series in talking about women, we were going to put the women together in pairs. And so we have paired Deborah with another woman leader named Jael. And Jael, uh, we'll talk about next week because she finishes the battle against Sisera. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this week's Bible study. And I look forward to seeing you next week when we talk about Jael. And uh, have a blessed and safe week, and we'll see you again.